before we go any further into this video, let's just make some general assumptions of the people that are going to view it. You walk up to a machine like this, you know that it's a bridge port. And all the shiny chrome knobs on it, the ones on the table, this guy right here moves it left and right. There's one on either end. This is your x-axis. The one in the front, there's only one crank. That's your y-axis moves it in and out. This is for the knee. You crank that, the whole mechanism goes up and down. We'll cover the controls on top, and I'll show you some attachments that I've built and some features you may not be aware of. Stick around. Hey guys, Joe Pizinski here from Advanced Innovations. If you are watching this video, you are probably new to this type of machine right here. This is a knee style vertical mill. This is a Bridgeport clone. And this is very much like a Bridgeport. It's got all the features a Bridgeport has without the price tag. Now, I've been asked to do a couple of videos, and uh, one of the suggestions was review the controls on this machine because there's an awful lot of knobs and nuts and buttons and levers and if you pull the wrong one at the wrong time well you may have a problem on your hands so let's start at the top run it all the way down to the bottom and for those of you that know what this machine is stick around I'll show you what this little nifty is right here or you can just fast forward to the end of the video and check it out if you're not interested in everything else this machine is a 949 ENCO, and 9 is the width of the table and how long the table is. That does not indicate how much room you have to mill, because naturally the saddle here in the center is going to take up some of the stroke, and the cranks cannot go beyond that. And on this side where the power feed is located, this unit right here, it will crash into the pickup scales for the digital readout underneath, so you're compromised there as well. Starting at the top, on top of the machine you have the draw bar. This is a very long nut, very long rod that goes all the way through the machine. There's currently a collet in here. When you tighten this up, the collet closes, squeezing the tool or whatever else you seem to be uh, putting in there. That is the most basic part of it. The on-off switch on the side, forward and reverse. Uh, will change directions and polarity when the machine is in high or low range. So depending on how your machine is wired, you know which way the switch goes to, to get on high speed. Oh, man, that almost make you dizzy. You know which way to turn the switch to put it in forward and reverse. And when you're in high or low range, that changes. So keep that in mind. And on some of these machines that are wired single phase, you can go to throw it directly into reverse and the electricity will just jump around inside there and the machine will continue to run forward which is an interesting dynamic when you're running a power tap down inside of a part and you think you're going to back it out and it doesn't happen ask me how I know this is a three phase motor on here and the three phase motor will allow you to go instantly from forward to reverse so make sure whatever you're doing you know exactly what you have it and how it's wired this is a variable speed machine. This dial right here, as you crank it clockwise or counterclockwise, the speed of the machine changes. It's that simple. If you're in high range, you look here for your basic uh, reference speed, and if you're in low range, right here. High and low speed on this machine can be accomplished by using this knob on the side, mark the speed range, high, neutral, and low. If you want to freewheel the spindle, if there's something in there that you want to turn by hand, like for indicating a part with an indicol on it, put it in neutral. And by doing that, you just push on this and slide it down here until it's not in either one of the detents. Simple. That is now in neutral. You want to put it in low, bring it around the back, lock it in. If you return it to the high range and it does not go into the high range, rotate the spindle by hand and you should see this jump up into position and lock. So that's high speed. Forward and reverse are controlled by the motor. This is just high range, low range on the gearing. This little guy right here is the engagement lever for the power feed on the down feed. Okay. Controlled by this, controlled by this, controlled by this, controlled by that. So 
all of this cluster right here is basically controlled by this. None of that works automatically if this is in the hand position. Okay, one's at hand and one's power. One you pull a lever and it goes down and in the hand position you can actually put a hand wheel on here, a crank, and turn it and feed the quill down. Now I've actually never done that. I've never seen the use for it since you have a handle on the side that controls it anyway. By pulling down on this handle, the quill goes down. Simple. The machine does telescope out. It can move in and out this way. It is on a large dovetail underneath and that is controlled by this is a lock nut, this is a lock nut, and these handles right here when you crank this is like closing a big steel door. The gear drive mechanism underneath will move this entire head forward. If you have a plate or a part that's just too wide, whether it's strapped to the table or in the vise, eventually when you crank the table in you're going to run out of room and if you can't reach the feature that you need to reach, well then you need to telescope the head, move it out. He said it's also have the capability to tilt this way, in and out, and rotate this way, quite a bit. When you rotate a head clockwise or counterclockwise, these four screws here need to be unloosened <laughs> before you can do that. And that rotation is controlled by this nut right here. It's another gear driven mechanism like a rear end of a car. As you crank this clockwise or counterclockwise, the head will respond accordingly. And once you get where you're going, make sure that you tighten these back up. Same thing for the tilt mechanism in the front. If you want the whole head to lift this way so that you can drill an angled hole or put a large chamfer on a part using a cutter, you unloosen one of these three, or actually you, you do it to all three. And that guy right there, you can see the screw mechanism down inside. As you turn that, the head will move. And this is just a balanced uh, ballet of moves when it comes time to tram the head. When you want to make sure that this head is exactly true to this table, you better have your uh, coordination going for that day because you've got a lot going on. The tilt and rotation of this head can be a, quite a gremlin to try to chase out. My machine is set up with a Kurt Weiss. This is a 675 Kurt Weiss. Six and three quarter opening, six inch wide. I think that's what the 675 is, six and three quarter. Uh, rotary table, 10 inch, and a tall part outrigger in the back. The power feed on the side has three different feed settings. This is the wheel that controls the speed settings, one, two, or three. And I don't know, you know, if anybody does know, by all means, tell me what it is. The one, two, and three is, I know it's high, medium, and low as far as the speed range is concerned, or fast, medium, and slow. But is there a reference to the RPM of the machine? I do not know. If you know, put it in the comment line below. Let me put this camera on a tripod, and we'll throw a couple of switches here and show you how everything works. As I know I've seen some comments about I threw the lever and nothing happened. Why is that? Well, let's check it out. First part of engaging a power feed on a quill is to make sure that this guy in the front, okay, I'm standing in the operator position right here, is in the power position. If it's over here in the hand position, none of the gears are meshed inside and you're not going to have any luck trying to turn the power on, the power feed on. In a previous video I showed you a collar that I put under the bottom here to take the slop out of this. Make sure there's no obstruction under here or you risk stripping your gears on the head when you engage the feed. We're going to leave the setting for the down feed right where it is. It's on the third position, number three, and I believe that is the most aggressive. This handle right here, this lever right here, pulls in and out. And like that, it pulls in and out. Actually, it pulls out and in, and there is a neutral position as well. Watch the rotation of the flange behind it. As the flange is rotating clockwise, the quill is going to be going down. And the counterclockwise, 
it's going to be coming up. I believe that holds true for high or low range. But by all means, if you're not sure, bring the quill down. Right here, you see this nut right here, this thing moving? Bring it down so it's about an inch off the top and bottom, and then engage your power feed. If there's any problems with your machine, if there's no kick out in the top, and you power feed up against the top, well then you risk having a real problem when it comes time to uh, saying that your gears are in good shape. Let's turn this machine on. Watch the rotation, engage the feed, and watch the activity of this guy right here. The machine is set to high range, spinning forward. You can see the control knob is pushed in for a down feed. The shaft is spinning clockwise. Now on a bridge port, I believe you need to pull down a little bit on the handle to engage it. And when you engage it, watch the whole shaft move up just a hair. See that? When those two surfaces now come together, the center thumb wheel and the quill stop, it's going to kick out. And when it kicks out, the lever is going to snap back in and the hand wheel or lever you have on the side of the machine will return to home. Watch your knuckles on that one. Now the spring on my machine is set so that it returns the quill handle to the top. It doesn't neutralize the weight. It doesn't hang there when there's no load on this handle. Watch the handle. I'll unlock. This is the lock for the spindle up and down. When I unlock this, watch this take off. That takes off pretty quick. If it's in a full rotation and it's around the back, when it comes time to return and you get your knuckles in the way, you're going to wish you didn't because it smacks you pretty good. That is a down feed. Let's do an up feed. All right, the machine is still in forward, still in high speed. By pulling out on the knob, you can see it'll momentarily stall. And when it's all the way out, now the shaft is spinning counterclockwise. When you engage the lever, the feed will come up. Now that little knob on the end has a bad habit of coming unscrewed. And quite often you'll see them, they're running out horribly. This one is running out a little bit. But they run out because when you're seating a piece on the bridge port or in the vise, you usually hit it with your hammer. So don't be ashamed if that happens. And when you're not using it. Put it in neutral. It's halfway between the in and the out. It should not be spinning right now. Either way. Okay. That's power feed. There's really nothing to it. This guy up here on the side that I've been grabbing unconsciously is the brake. Depending on how tight the band inside your machine is, you'll notice that the other top side of this is usually got a fairly large radius on it. That way you can crank it to one side and pull it out and it cams and it stays like that and can be a real help for keeping the spindle locked if you don't want it to rotate. Okay, it's cammed like that for a reason. It should return to the center neutral position when you unlock it, which it does. Okay, Get close up on the front of that. That's the cam right there. Cam it and jam it. Only after you Go clockwise or counterclockwise, it really doesn't matter which way you turn that, it's going to bind the spindle and lock. It's not a mechanical lock, it's a strap lock. So if you were to accidentally hit that while the machine's running, it's not going to grind off anything and ruin your day. These guys in the front underneath are table locks for the x-axis. When you snug these up, you can have a little bit more fun climb cutting because the table's not going to have a tendency to want to run away from you. A y-axis lock is on the side and the Z which is the up and down is right here in the back. This is an oiler for the machine. As you depress this it forces oil through all these lines right here and oils the machine. machine is very versatile, it's really straightforward. And the one thing, like, you know, I got a part like this laying on my bench. And this is a finished part, so this is uh, it's a good example, but I'm not going to be able to cut it for you to show you. It is an extremely long part. And on the end, we have this little ditty right here. Nice little cutout. No big deal, right? Set up a boring head or a fly cutter or something and come down across that. But, guess what? 
we have weld relief in the face of this and there is only one way to do that two ways actually you could do it with a 90 degree head but not everybody has one so we have to stand this part up in the mill and boy that's pretty long so let me demonstrate the outrigger that I have on this machine that was designed to be held in a cart vise but you can also bolt it to the table and then I'll show you how to swing the head around and get your cutter over something like that so you can machine it. Okay, this particular outrigger on the end of my machine allows me to hold long pieces up to four feet actually. And this particular one has just got a bump stop on the bottom and there's a pin on the very bottom for the parts that this was intended to do which are a little bit longer. Now you can see that there is no way this is going to go this way. It's just not going to happen. Got about two inches of room on the bottom and about a two inch long feature. So be very aware if you start putting outriggers on your machine what's in the way. The only way to get around this is to swing the head. We need to get this over here. So this is now the pretend center of the table and we can do whatever we want. The machine is completely capable of doing that. These two bolts and two on the other side, identical, will rotate the machine and if the spindle happens to be over in this area here, we can then telescope out into position. So let's put this on a tripod and see how fast we can get that over there. Very first thing I'm going to do is remove all the locking bolts, not remove them, but unloosen them from the side that I can access first. These are the telescoping bolts. There's only two. And I never crush down on these because it's actually holding on the dovetail inside. So I'll take them to the place where they're finger tight or finger loose. These also. Snug is good. Okay, I'm just going to step around the back of the machine and do these two bolts on the other side. This is not a procedure that you normally have to retram the head after you do it. If you don't trust your machine, then by all means check it when you get there. But for the most part, I just return it to zero and leave it be. Okay, with those screws successfully removed or, or taken to the movable state, turning this counterclockwise will telescope the head forward. Okay, see the whole head moving out. Now I like to use it as handlebars, and I'm going to take and twist the entire machine now so that it rotates and gets the spindle. closer to that part. If it does start to get snug, check the nuts. When you're in the ballpark and you are happy with the offset alignment and you are right over your part, make sure that you're paying attention to what side of the slot you're on. If there's any size problems down here, you want to move away from any obstructions. So position your tool to the outside of the part so the part movement, the table movement is away from the obstruction. You have everything you like. I like it right where it is. I will now tighten up these two on this side, two on the other side, and the two that assisted me in telescoping out. And we'll load a slug in there and show you the alignment. When you load a collet into these machines, these are R8 collets. There is a key in one side. It will not go in unless it's correctly clocked. Spin it gently until it drops in. Okay, there you go. When the collet is pushed all the way up, the draw bar nut on top of the machine that I showed you initially is now lifted up out of its resting position. Screw it down until you have a little bit of motion on the collet. See it moving? 
I'm just going to put a stylus in here for now. I don't want to put a cutter in. Push up on it to secure it. Spin it down by hand. I always pull on my cutter. Put side load on it as I tighten up the top. That keeps it from dropping out. When I'm sure that the collet's got a good bite on it, I will grab the brake and drive it home. Now with the head comfortably thrown, I think it's pretty clear to see that we're well within the boundaries of that part and we can get that slot done no problem. There's a 29 inch long extruded piece of aluminum. The machine is about 40 degrees out of skew or more. And I always have a telescope marked on my machine because I, I know right where everything seems to line up and be happy and that is back here. So I'm about two and a half inches forward. Make sure you're not going to snap any wires off. I do have a power strip on the back of my machine. It works really well. I screwed this back here. It's for my power feed for my X table. It's for my digital readout and I have two lamps plugged into it as well. Keeps everything nice and clean right on the back of the machine. There you go, guys. If there have any questions about any of the other controls or nuts or levers on this machine, put it in the comment line below. It may look intimidating, but if you know each and every one of these, it's really not a big deal. Very versatile machine. Good addition to the shop. If you don't have one of these long outriggers, sooner or later you're going to make one. Uh, like I said before, this machine is usually set up with two vices, two curts on there, and this particular configuration is meant to be squeezed in the curt vise and then bolt through the back. So this is a really quick thing to set up. Very rarely do I actually bolt it directly to the table like that, but this can be used in this format or 90 degrees. Hope that helped. Thanks for watching.